Welcome to The Liberating Secret with your host, author and teacher, Sylvia Pierce. The Liberating Secret is dedicated to revealing the mystery of the gospel, which is Christ in you, the only hope of glory. Let's join Sylvia Pierce for today's lesson. Welcome to The Liberating Secret. My name is Sylvia Pierce, and I'm so glad to be with you again today. Uh, we're right in the book of Hebrews, having a great time, just talking about the blood of Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world, our Lord Jesus Christ, talking about his shed blood. And this chapter says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so, and without us taking the blood of Jesus Christ as our, and, and counting that for our redemption and the eternal life, none of us really have eternal life apart from the blood of Christ. So actually, the blood of Christ is really, uh, should be taught when the gospel is taught. I mean, is your church teaching the gospel? You know, we say we have gospel songs and we say, um, you know, that this is a gospel believing church. Well, if it's not teaching about the blood and the body of Christ, maybe it's not. I would, I'm not going to judge. You, you, you'll know. But the cross of Christ, uh, that's where our, that's where our salvation, that's, centers in the blood of Jesus Christ and the, the sacrifice that he made at Calvary. You see, that's the only way that we have forgiveness of sins. All right, now we're getting ready to go into chapter 10. Now, you know, when you go to your fellowship or your churches, or uh, sometimes you might even do it personally yourself and have communion, just think of this. When you have communion, um, you, you, there's grape juice or there's a little wafer, both. Actually, that represents what happens to happen to you at the cross. Actually, the communion service that we have so oftentimes, it's, it's kind of put you down because you've got to think of, oh my gosh, have I sinned and I can't take this unless if I've sinned and I don't know if I've sinned today or not. And so you're, you're constantly analyzing yourself and trying to figure out if I've ascended or not. Am I worthy to even take this? Do you know what? I honestly think the communion service is really meant to be. It's meant to be a celebration. A celebration of the blood and body of Christ. And what Christ accomplished for us at the cross. So instead of lamenting and worrying about each little sin, you can say, you can start off by saying, Lord, when you take that little communion cup, you can say, Lord, thank you that you have forgiven me of all my sins. Thank you. I take it on behalf of your sacrifice and I apply it to myself. And I thank you that all my sins have been forgiven. But then when we have the little wafer, and sometimes the little wafer comes first, but I'm doing it this way because in the book of Hebrews, it starts out with the blood of Christ in chapter 9. Now it's going to go into the body of Christ in chapter 10. Chapter 10 is really one of my favorites. Okay, so the body of Christ. So why do we need the body of Christ? And what do I say about the body of Christ when I take it at my communion service? You can say to the Lord, thank you, Lord. Let this be a great celebration for all that you have accomplished for us at the cross. You did a finished work for us. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us through your bodily death and resurrection. You know, a lot of times we hear the blood of Christ, we even sing those songs. There's power in the blood. But rarely do we really understand what took place and what we have inherited through the bodily death of Christ. Well, you see, it's not good enough that the blood, that it's just the blood of Christ, 
that we understand that and we don't understand what we've what has been accomplished for us in the body of Christ. If we go to um, chapter 6 of Romans, we can see that through the body of Christ, we've met, we are dead to sin. Now, let me say this to you. The blood of Christ satisfies God because God promised if we sinned, if Adam sinned, then he would die spiritually, which he did, and then eventually physically. And so everybody is born dead in their trespasses and sins because we're, we all are born fallen beings, every one of us. There's not anybody that's not. Okay. So it's not good enough that God's justice is satisfied, and that's through the blood of Christ because the wages of sin is death. So God's justice is satisfied because he put his own son on the cross to die on our behalf. Wow. Representing us vicariously being us there 2,000 years ago. The Bible says that God was in Christ Jesus reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing our sins to us. So to all them that have received Christ, that are in Christ your sins are not imputed to us. So it's, it satisfies God. The blood of Christ satisfies God's justice. But wait a minute. God is full of mercy. What good is it if God is satisfied and we live a total dissatisfied life? Why? Because we don't understand what happened in the body of Christ. Wow. The bodily death of Christ. Now, let's look at some of the scriptures before I go into this chapter, because this is what it, it's telling us through the body of Christ, what we, what has, we've inherited, what was accomplished, and this is why we take that little wafer when we, when we do communion. Okay, first thing that we're going to look at is in is in Romans chapter 6. And then I'm going to just turn to these real quick. And we're going to read it. Chapter 6 of Romans. It says this. Um, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin? Shall we sin lawlessly is what it means. That grace might abound. In other words, do we sin all the time because we think, oh, well, my sins are all forgiven, so I can just sin every day and it's okay. Because it shows up how merciful and how full of grace God is. Well, God and Paul really puts a great, great big no to that thought. God forbid. That's not what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about the very fact that we are dead to sin gives us a license to sin. And it's and because this is what he says. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? God forbid. Okay, how can we live any, any longer in sin? And then because we do not understand really how we've already been delivered from the sinful nature, the satanic nature that we all inherited through Adam. That's what the bodily death is all about. It delivers us from the sin nature. Because Romans says in chapter 6, knowing this, that the old man is crucified with Christ, that the body of sin might that henceforth might be destroyed or done away with, that henceforth we should not serve sin. So, you see, now the bodily death of Christ when we understand the provision that God has provided through his bodily death, we can know that he has provided us with a divine nature and he, he has delivered us from a satanic nature. Wow, wow, that's big. So in our communion service, let's go back there, we can start praising the Lord that you've already delivered me from a sinful nature because that's exactly what Romans chapter 6 is saying. 
I'm already delivered from a sinful nature. Well, then you might ask, well, then why do I still sin? We're going to go back. We're going to go to that. But first of all, I want you to know what you're already delivered from. Sin or the sinful nature. The old man was crucified with Christ. You are delivered through his bodily death. All right. What else are we delivered from? Well, in Romans chapter 7, verse 4, tells us this. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are, de are become dead to the law by the bodily death of Christ. So by the bodily death, we're dead to sin, the old nature, and we're also dead to the law. Well, that's why, you see, people still sin because they're living from a delusion thinking that they can manage and, uh, and uh, keep themselves from sinning all the time by doing maybe good works, by maybe reading the Bible more and trying to get more of the presence of God. I want to tell you something. When you were born again of the Spirit of God, just like Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again uh, of the Spirit of God. When you were born again of the Holy Spirit, you received the fullness of everything that God imparted to you. He imparted to you his own divine nature through the bodily death of Christ. Now, Peter even says that. Let's turn to Peter, uh, 2 Peter, not 1 Peter, but 2 Peter. And we can see this, that what's already been given to us through the cross. Okay, verse, uh, verse 3. Chapter 1. Accordingly, as his divine power hath given unto us all things pertaining to life, eternal life, and godliness, through the knowledge of him who hath called us to glory and virtue. Okay. Whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises through the new covenant. That's what we're discussing, the new covenant, what, it, what Christ offers us through these promises of the new covenant. What are they? By which these, you might be partakers of the divine nature. Now, partaker means that you live by it, just like we partake food every day. We live by these truths, live by this. I'm partaking of this truth that Jesus through his bodily death, I'm now a partaker of the divine nature. When we don't know we're partakers of the divine nature, we think we can still live by our own self-effort, which would be by law, by what I can do, what I don't do, what I can do. So through the bodily death of Christ, you've been delivered from the I ought to and I should mentality. That's the cleansed consciousness that it's talking about in the book of Hebrews. It's saying that cleanse your consciousness from dead works. Our minds have to be renewed to the truth of what is provided for us through the gospel, through the new covenant of Christ, through the New Testament instead of the Old Testament. The Old Testament was the old will which demanded self uh, allegiance and flesh activity. The new covenant demands rest and promises and fulfillment because of what God has already imparted to you through the New Testament. God has already given you divine nature, but you've got to learn how to partake of it. You've got to learn how to, how to when temptation, when the devil comes on you and thinks, oh my gosh, if I don't do this, if I don't do that, I'm not going to have God's presence. I'm not going to, I'm going to be far away from God. I'm not walking near God. If you think that, you can come back and renew your mind to the truth. Oh, that's right, Lord. You've put your whole self inside me. And I'm go I've got the divine nature in me. So I'm just going to say, now the Christ is in me. The divine nature is now my nature. I don't still have an old nature. That's a lie. I'm going to refuse that. That's not the truth. The truth is that I have the new nature. I have the divine nature. Now you're going to start taking, partaking of that divine nature. And you're going to be dead to the law 
because the law only shouts at us when we think we're separate from Christ, when we're independent from Christ, and we have to work up our own salvation. We have to work it up through our own self-effort to make Christianity work, you see. That's, when, that's why the Bible says, through the communion service, take that wafer, and I want you to praise me that you are not only dead to the old nature because you're dead to sin, through Christ, because he died in your behalf, and you're also dead to the law. That's why it says in Colossians that through the cross, he nailed those ordinances to the cross in Christ. Because through, see, see, you see, the Old Testament was about flesh behavior. Flesh behavior. Well, if you haven't learned it now, you will sometime in your life that through your own achievements, through your own trying to live the Christian life, trying to be a good person, trying to be as righteous as you can, that you will fail most of the time. Why? Because you're trying to do it apart from the divine nature that lives inside of you. You're trying to take the Holy Spirit's place. Do you all realize that? When we think that we can be like God, and that's really the mentality that Satan had, I'm going to be like the Most High God. I'm going to do it. I'm going to be good enough. I'm going to take God's place. Don't you realize that we Christians are thinking the same exact way? We need to renew our minds to the truth. There is no independent self in me. I can't rise up and do it, but I've got the divine nature inside of me. God has promised that to me through the New Testament, through the New Covenant. That's what I've inherited. I'm going to go take what I have now inherited through his bodily death. And it's going to cleanse my consciousness from all these dead works that I think I can do apart from Christ and cause me to know that I'm a partaker of the divine nature. Wow. Wow. When you know that, you're going to know you're dead to the law. You're dead to sin. You've got to know that. You're dead to the old nature. You take that by faith. You can't know anything of God unless you take it by faith that it's already true, even before it seems to be true, even before you're even manifesting it. You take it by faith that God, the Lord Jesus Christ, has provided this for you through the cross. Forgiveness of sins, that satisfies God's justice. But I've got to be satisfied. We, the body of Christ, has to be satisfied. How are we? I'm totally satisfied because God has imparted to me his own divine nature. And I'm going to live from that. I'm not going to live from my own life. I'm not going to live from my own ideas of what Christianity is or could be. I'm going to live from what he has imparted to me when I was born again through the Holy Spirit of God. Wow. Do you know where the Spirit of God is? There is liberation. There is no liberation if you're still trying to live the Christian life apart from the Holy Spirit within you, apart from the divine nature. There's no liberation. It's only the truth that sanctifies us. That's what Jesus says in John uh, 17. John 17 uh, is Jesus's great intercessory prayer to his father right before he died. You know, before you would pass, if you knew that you were going to die soon, you the most important prayer of your life would, um, would come out of you, I'm sure. Well, this is the most important prayer that Jesus prayed to his Father. Listen to what he says in chapter 17 of verse, verse 16. He says, well, let me start with 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world. Now, he was praying to, about his disciples but he says, I'm not just praying for the disciples. I'm praying for everybody that's yet to come in the body of Christ. That's for us too. I'm not, he says, I'm not praying that you take them out of the world, out of every awful situation. I'm not, I'm not telling you to take them out of their troubles. Wow. Jesus is saying this. I'm not praying that, that, that God, the Father, don't take these disciples and these apostles out of the, their afflictions and their troubles. He says, but that thou shouldest keep them 
from the evil. What would be the evil? It would be turning back. It would be unbelief. That's the real evil. It would be believing everything Satan says to you. <laughs> it would be believing Satan. It would be believing. It would be unbelief in the fact that God has given, has given you everything in Christ already. But this is what he says. They are not of this world and neither are we. We're of a new kingdom. Not the kingdom of this world. The kingdom of this world is the kingdom of satanic darkness. The kingdom of God is the kingdom of light and, 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 and life. It's eternal life, really. So he says, I'm not going to take you out of this dark place, though, as I am not of the world, because he was given to the world, put into this dark place in the beginning, that he might be the light of the world. And that's what we are. We are the light of the world. But this is what he says. Sanctify them, Father, through thy truth. Thy word is truth. What Jesus Christ has accomplished for us at Calvary is the truth that sanctifies us. Okay. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sake I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth, the truth of the gospel, the truth of the true communion service, that we might not just take it when maybe weekly or monthly, however it might be offered to you in your, in your church circles, but that we commune with the Lord every day and we thank him for the blood of Jesus cleansing us from all sin. And we praise him that through his bodily death, that he was made sin on our behalf, that we might be made his righteousness. And we are absolutely declared righteous before the Father. Now, let me tell you, the devil will tell you you're still a sinner. The devil will tell you you're, you're saved, but you're still a sinner. Look at you, look at you, look at you. You look down at yourself and try to analyze yourself, and you'll, it will be endless forms of self-analysis. And some people even call it navel gazing, looking at yourself. You look up to what God has pro provided for you through Jesus Christ. And you, this, tr this truth of the blood and the body of Christ will sanctify you. That's why it's so important to understand chapter 10. That's what we're in right now. And I'm just going to read the first verses of chapter 10 because I see we don't have a whole lot of time ready uh, at this time, but we're coming back to give you the fullness of chapter 10. Look at it. Chapter 10, verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, it was only a shadow. It was only there temporary. It was a temporary fix, as, as it were, because the permanent was going to come. Okay. And not even the, the and not the very image of the things can never with the those sacrifices, in other words, the sacrifices of blood and animals, which they were they offered year by year, that's in the day of atonement, continually make the person that comes with their little lamb to be sacrificed, therefore perfect or sanctified or complete in Christ. We look at this word perfect in the New Testament and we think, well, I can't be perfect, so God doesn't expect me to be perfect. So therefore, it kind of gives me an excuse just to not press through and find out what perfection really means in the Bible. You know what it really means? It really means that Christ's very own divine nature be formed in you. Why? Because you partake of his divine nature and you know that through his bodily death, he sanctified you. That's what that's what this chapter 10 is all about. And we're going to find that. But let me read the next verse before we run out of time because it's so important. Chapter 10, verse 2. For then would they not have ceased to be offered. In other words, you see, if the blood of bulls and goats could actually sanctify us, then they would, they would stop being offered. We would be sanctified. And so they wouldn't have to be offered again but that didn't happen. They had to do it year after year after year. Why? Because it was only a permanent, uh, uh, temporary fix is what I call it. To, to have my sins 
our sins forgiven in the Old Testament, the Old um, Covenant. Because that the worshipers once purged, if they were really totally purged by the blood of goats and animals, they should not have any more consciousness of sins. Do you know what this verse is telling us? This verse is telling us since the old way, which was through blood, the blood of bulls and goats, could never take away this sin consciousness, never do it, because year after year we still had a sin consciousness. We were still concentrating on our sins and how to be forgiven all the time. If, that, if we were really once purged, that means cleansed from all sin, then all that go, going to the tabernacle, going and sprinkling that blood over the uh, mercy seat year after year would end. But it wasn't a per permanent fix. It was only a temporary time of covering over those sins until the blood of Jesus and the body of Jesus come to purely purge us of all sin. Wow. Let me just read the first the first chapter of Hebrews says this. Jesus Christ, who was the brightness of God's glory, the express image of his person, upholding all things by the word of his power, that, that by himself purged your sins, sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. Wow, this is so great. This is so great. I'm going to end today because I've just run out of time. So thank you for joining me. Please, please keep turning, tuning into this and see how we're sanctified through this precious and wonderful promises of God. Goodbye. I hope that you are being blessed by the liberating secret. If you would like to have for yourself my books, booklets, or any of my TV or radio series, check out our website's bookstore. Our TV shows are also on our YouTube site. And be sure to get the Liberating Secret app for your phone. We have an annual Louisville conference in June, as well as a biannual Women's Retreat at Polly's Island, South Carolina. Come for a weekend or a week of study, fun, fellowship by the ocean. We also have a weekly Bible study See our website for times and location. My husband and Scott and I would love to come and share the liberating truth to your fellowship, church, or home group. Please call or contact us through the website. If you would like to donate to our ministry, make your checks out to Christ Our Life Ministries, Post Office Box 43268, Louisville, Kentucky, 40253. Please pray for us, and we will pray God's very best for you.